Professor Creswell, thank you for accepting to give an interview for the Arthur Pryor and Temporal Logic Studies website, which is a joint venture between Copenhagen and Aalborg Universities, and which in fact goes back quite a long way, beginning already in the mid-90s. You are yourself one of the most important and well-known contributors to the development of modal logic. Just to mention one, highlight your work together with G.E. Hughes, an introduction to modal logic from 1968 was absolutely seminal. It was surely the single most important step in the development and establishment of this by now a crucially important field. You are, uh, like Pryor himself, from New Zealand, where you did your BA and MA with first class honors, and where you are and have been a professor for many years. In 1964, you obtained your PhD in the University of Manchester with Pryor as your supervisor. Uh, and finally, let me also mention that you are a fellow of the Royal Society of New Zealand. For the viewers of this interview, it may also be worth knowing that I am myself a professor of information science in the University of Copenhagen, and together with Professor Peter Ostrom from Aalborg University, principal developer of and responsible for the Arthur Pryor and Temporal Logic Studies website, including the presentation and systematization of the material in the Bodleian Library, Oxford. Moreover, Peter Ostrom and I are the organizers and chairs of the Arthur Pryor Centenary Conference at Balliol College in the University of Oxford this year. The date of this interview is 12th August 2014. And now for the interview itself. Question one. <laughs> you went to Manchester in the early 60s to do your PhD, where Arthur Pryor, as already mentioned, became your supervisor. Please tell us about your motivation for choosing to go to Manchester for the degree, how much did you know about Pryor in advance, and this, did this play any role for your going there? Yes, well, I went up as an undergraduate to Victoria University of Wellington in 1957, what was then Victoria University College, which was a constituent college of the University of New Zealand, went, which went out of existence in 1963. And I went there initially to study law, and when in order to study law, you had to do at least one year of what were called art subjects, general subjects from the BA uh, curriculum. Mm -hmm. And one of these was philosophy. And I noticed that philosophy uh, at its second level had two subparts, logic and ethics. And I thought both of these were mm -hmm. things that a lawyer should know about. And I, I soon discovered that a lawyer didn't need to know about either of them. <laughs> and I soon discovered that I was no good at law. And in the first year, in 1957, the first year philosophy course consisted of an introduction to Western philosophy from ancient Greece to the end of the 19th century. And one part of it was Aristotelian syllogistic logic. And for the first time, I think, in all of my uh, scholarly career, uh, such as it was at high school, it was the first time that it grabbed me completely and just working out syllogisms. It was just ordinary plain right. syllogistic logic and I fell completely in love with it and thought, well, wow, this is what I, I this was unlike anything I had, I, I had ever met. And there was more logic in the second year in 1958 and in the summer vacation I went into the university library before the start of my second year because logic was one of the uh, was half of the second year philosophy course then, and found a book in the library. It was called Formal Logic, and I started reading it, and then I looked at the front, and I said, well, this was written by somebody who was in New Zealand. And uh, that surprised me a little, and I went and was, was captivated uh, by this. Curiously enough, it meant that the first book of modern symbolic logic I read was one that was written in, uh, in Polish notation. So although I haven't used Polish notation, I don't, it doesn't have quite the fear factor for me that it seems to have with most logicians, so mm. I was aware mm. of that. Mm. I mentioned uh, this, and I mentioned the name of the author to George Hughes, who was the professor of philosophy at that time, uh, 
And he said, oh yes, he, he, knew, he knew Pryor uh, quite well and uh, told me a little bit about him. And then halfway during the second year, uh, the second year that was uh, divided into two parts, half of it was logic, half of it was ethics. Uh, the logic was the bit that interested me. And we had three lectures a week, plus one what was called a tutorial, which was, wasn't a tutorial in the sense of Oxford or Cambridge. It wasn't a one-on-one. -on -one. It was where the group of us in the class would meet with the, with the teacher and we would raise any questions we had. For some reason, all my colleagues were not as interested in logic as I was, and although they kept coming to the lectures, they didn't come to the tutorial, so that I was the only one. And at one point, I remember asking George Hughes, I said, well, is there, is there more logic of a different kind than, uh, than we're studying? And he put into my hands a book uh, written by uh, George Henrik von Reicht, uh, which was called An Essay in Modal Logic. This was written in 1951. And I found that quite a difficult book. And then later I discovered that the, the, the in formal logic there was a, 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 more, a, a more approachable account of modal logic as it then was. And of course as it then was, was just um, was um, almost completely axiomatic. And then at the end there was no, there was no logic in the third year course. We had uh, ancient philosophy, we had a politics and ethics course and uh, another course I think on epistemology. And then we have in New Zealand we had a three-year BA followed by one year which was called the honours year and at that stage you had four what were called four papers which meant four courses, four, four examinable courses plus the writing of a thesis to the value of two of the courses and if you did all six in other words the thesis mm -hmm. worth two courses plus the four courses if you did all six you graduated with a master of arts with an ma and you could do all of that in one year and i elected to do write an ma thesis on modal logic i was interested in um, the connection between modal logic and quantifiers and they sent the uh, uh, they needed an external examiner for the for the MA thesis, so they sent that to Arthur Pryor, and he thought uh, well enough of it. And uh, partly as a result of his uh, examining of that, I was able to get a scholarship. They were, there was a new scheme just introduced called Commonwealth Scholarships, which was for all countries of the old British Commonwealth, mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. they would each offer uh, uh, scholarships to students from other Commonwealth countries. And I was managed to get one of those to uh, to move to uh, to uh, Manchester. They the reason I was sent to Manchester was was def very definitely because they they knew Pryor and he, oh. he, he was mm. familiar with my work. Also, in those days, Oxford was in the grip of the ordinary language movement, which was in many ways anti-logic, mm -hmm. and um, the traditional mm. path for philosophy students wanting to do graduate work overseas was to go to Oxford to do the Bachelor of Philosophy there. But they said to me, no, you're interested in logic, don't, just don't even think about going to Oxford. <laughs> they thought no. that if I couldn't get into Manchester, no. I could go and work with Timothy Smiley in Cambridge. But mm -hmm. um, So for that reason, I was sent to Manchester to work with Arthur Pryor. So the answer to mm -hmm. your mm -hmm. question mm -hmm. is yes. Mm -hmm. Um, although I had not met Pryor before, I, while I was an undergraduate, I was taught by people who had a very close connection <laughs> with him yes, and yes. Was, uh, was deliberately recommended to go there. And I think partly because of that and partly because of his, uh, um, his, his presumably he wrote letters to the, to the scholarship funding body, I was able mm -hmm. to move there. So that mm -hmm. my going to Manchester was very definitely because Pryor was there, yes, so there yes. was no question about that. Well, that fills in a lot of uh, very interesting <laughs> details. Uh, I, well, I must admit that I was uh, unaware of uh, most of them uh, in advance. Okay. But it's quite funny to, to, to think about your motivation for going to Manchester rather than, than Oxford, considering that Pryor, in fact, himself soon after went to Oxford. But where he took up, of yes. course, the, the, yes. the fight for logic as that's opposed right. to ordinary language philosophy, yes. but that's another uh, story. Yeah. Yes. Well, uh, Pryor pointed out uh, the intimate connection between time and modality. 
not least of course with the crucial and eponymous work time and modality from 1957. How was the relation between time and modality generally perceived in the 50s and why did it last so long before the connection was more generally accepted? That's a question I would be answering more with hindsight than, than, than how I felt at that time. Uh, when I went there, I went, I, I, I was interested, the, the topic of my PhD uh, was what was called general and specific logics of propositions. Um, it was, when I look at it now, I think it was an appallingly bad piece of work myself, but still. Um, the, um, at one point in formal logic, prior quotes a passage, I think it's from Isaac Watts, the hymn writer, who was also a logician, which says, it was believed, or it was said by the ancients that P, and he thought there was an embarrassment of riches there to look at general logics of that kind, and that was, mm -hmm. that was my motivation. I had certainly read Time and Modality, uh, that, that, as you know, came out in, in 1957, and I, 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 I was familiar with that before I went to Manchester. Not so much the time part, it was more, um, it's interesting with hindsight, with hindsight Pryor seems to have seen there was such a thing as modal logic which was connected with necessity and possibility and then he saw that time could be expressed in the same way. I think now we think of the logic of time. We think of time intervals and truth at a moment. We think of that as semantically, in a sense, easier and that possible worlds were introduced by realizing that modality could be studied the way time was studied. Whereas when you, when you read time and modality, and I wasn't aware of this until many years later, it was that modal logic was a given that was there, and it was discovering that you could think of time using modal logic, so it was almost the reverse direction. Mm -hmm. Now, that meant that if you were going to study, as, as I was with Prior, you would be going to a place where the interest was modal logic. Now, he happened to have an interest in its application to time, but in a sense I went there because we were studying, in a sense, we were studying modal logic, mm -hmm. and in fact studying logic in which you couldn't even allow replacement of logically equivalent propositions. If you do the possible world semantics, if P and Q are true in exactly the same worlds, then of course necessary P and necessary Q are going to be true in exactly the same worlds, and all the operators that we can define in that way will respect uh, two propositions which are true at exactly the same set of indices. Whereas prior was uh, one, one of the principles that I was looking at when I was doing the PhD work arose from a principle that Pryor, I think, believed in metaphysically, that no proposition could be a logical complication of itself. And what that meant was that if you had one proposition P, well, of course, not P can't be the same as P, but more than that, for Pryor, not not P wasn't the same as P, and not 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 P wasn't the same. And that mm -hmm. meant that you could start off with a proposition call it, say, the standard false proposition and call that the number zero and then its negation could be the number one and its negation could be the number two. Mm -hmm. And one of the uh, uh, questions I looked at in, 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 in the PhD work was what I call propositional arithmetic. So that for prior uh, propositions, well, it's not clear that, that, uh, that he believed in propositions. In fact, at the time I was in Manchester, he must have been writing the book that became Objects of Thought, but I wasn't really aware, I wasn't really aware of his metaphysical views. I was much more concerned to think of his views as saying, well, there are such things as propositions, and if none is a logical complication of itself, then there are going to be infinitely many propositions, and they're going to form a number sequence, and so you can use propositional mm -hmm. logic with quantification mm -hmm. over propositions, and functions of propositions, you can use that kind of logic to do things like develop arithmetic and do a lot of the things that we normally do just using ordinary mm -hmm. predicate logic with individuals. And that was, mm -hmm. the, that was the interest for me mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. at Manchester, which was, it was certainly one of Pryor's interests, and it is strong in, uh, in formal logic, but it wasn't so much the tense logic, so that the, 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 um, mm -hmm. although I was obviously aware of his interest in time, because I, mm -hmm. I, I was read time and modality, it wasn't, 
it wasn't something that I was particularly conscious of when I was in Manchester. It was later on when I was beginning to work in modal logic, particularly looking at the modal logic textbook, that uh, we were looking at a Pryor's um, concern with modal logic, for instance, the axioms that give you linearity and the axioms that give you discreteness and, and things mm -hmm. like that. That came much later for me. Yes, yes. Well, your, your, um, I think uh, your answer actually anticipates some of my questions, oh, but, okay. uh, <laughs> but uh, if there is a little overlap, I think we can survive it. <laughs> I hope so. uh, my next question is uh, whether you to, to those observations could add a, a more general uh, description of the position which Pryor had achieved uh, in the course of the 50s within modal and temporal logic. Yes, well, in fact, one of the interesting things about growing up in New Zealand and growing up with people who had been influenced mm. by Pryor mm. mm. is that we didn't actually appreciate that Quine had proved that modal logic was no good. We didn't actually get that <laughs> message, or as they now say, we didn't get the email that modal logic was bad. We went ahead and did it. And, and when I, so my, my feeling there was, well, yes, there was such a thing as modal logic. I'd looked at, in fact, if you looked at the early issue years of the Journal of Symbolic Logic, you find a great deal of modal logic uh, in it there. Uh, there were there were Quine's worries, but they were they were not really uh, they were not really strong in the Journal of Symbolic Logic. So I had looked at work uh, by McKinsey, work by other people. Uh, Kripke's uh, article in 1959 had just come out in the journal and, and Pryor mentioned that um, when we were talking. I didn't really appreciate at that point what was going on because the kind of logic I was taught was very formal and very axiomatic mm -hmm. and in so far as it was interpreted I think we just took it and interpreted it intuitively and of course a lot of, of Pryor's work up to that point wasn't involved in what we now call semantics. It wasn't involved with the definition of the truth conditions of, of sentences and therefore a completeness proof. So I, well, I didn't really know what a completeness proof was, but I certainly did know that of the people who were writing about modal logic, probably Arthur Pryor's work was the one that, that made most intuitive sense. A lot of the other work that I was looking at within the Journal of Symbolic Logic was it was technically interesting there were there were interesting things a lot of work then was uh, why uh, the, uh, Lewis's system S1 was much weaker than the others what sorts of things it did and didn't have uh, we were much less clear I think then with the relation between uh, that logic and the other systems between faces system T and I remember being quite struck when I was writing the MA thesis which was on modal logic th at the fact that the S1 did not allow replacement of proved material equivalents. That was something that I thought was was rather strange, and that if you added it, you got uh, you got uh, to S5 from it. So it was it was in that kind of area that I was able to recognise Pryor as one of the people working. But you have to remember, I was a um, at that stage. By the time I finished the the uh, the MA, I had only just turned. 21, I was still quite naive and I didn't really have a, a strong idea of just who was doing what. I knew that Pryor was one of the people who was working in modal logic. I was certainly unaware that, that uh, I was unaware of the fact that people working in modal logic were regarded as odd in many parts of the philosophical world. I just thought of modal logic as in some sense mainstream and Arthur Pryor was one of the one of the people, and one of the people that I knew that had uh, that that was very strong and very preeminent in this, and it was. I don't think I was in a position to sort of form a list of who, who the famous mm. people no. were and mm. how they were ordered. I just mm. knew that I, mm. I did. I was very impressed at what well, now, of course, we take as obvious the connection between quantifier, the structural connection between quantifiers and modal operators. And that's one of the things that you find stressed both in time and modality and in formal mm -hmm. logic, the mm -hmm. connection between mm -hmm. operators and quantifiers. Mm -hmm. And that was something that I got from prior because 
I, I don't remember seeing that in the other the other articles that that, that I was mm -hmm. reading at the time, and that mm -hmm. was that was the connection mm -hmm. I was looking at uh, in 1960 mm -hmm. when I was writing the NA oh, thesis. Oh. Uh, but then mm -hmm. it was this Pryor's remark about there might be operators that didn't even respect uh, proved equivalence mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. logical equivalence. That was something which uh, which I found interesting. And uh, and that was what I what I what I wanted to, to wanted to take up. Yeah. Uh, now, in 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 the course of the six in the in the course of the sixties, uh, semantics received a great boost, of course, mm -hmm. not least with the work of Montague, but yes. but also others. But even though uh, Pryor himself uh, studied uh, uh, relations between operators and quantifiers and did things like um, his famous study in, in the logic of earlier and later where he studies these systematical relations, he seemed somewhat reserved towards uh, semantics. He seemed to favor till the end of his life uh, axiomatic uh, approaches. Um, do, you have any, um, do you have any idea uh, why? Well, there are a number of things, and again, yeah. this, is, this is a little bit with hindsight. One of the things I think is this. He was always unimpressed by the power of set theory. If you look at the beginning of um, formal logic, he will say that while he thinks modal logic is a genuine extension of ordinary predicate logic, he thinks that set theory is, is not. It's just doing predicate logic in a different way. Mm -hmm. And I think, mm -hmm. now I have to say I think here, because when you're looking at his work, it, he, he was... It was, although he was not an ordinary language philosopher himself, because he did things using logic, I think he shared the idea that you didn't have to reflect too much about what you were doing, you were just mm. doing it. And I think his view was this, that if you wanted to talk about time, you find a precise language to talk about it. If you believe that time is based on tense, then that precise language will be a non-extensional temporal language and if you try to do it semantics by using a meta language of set theory you're taking the language which describes the reality of the world and interpreting it interpreting it in a language which doesn't describe mm -hmm. the language of the world so that mm -hmm. i think he really genuinely didn't see the point of taking the truths of tense logic so he was using the form, the formal language, the formal object language of tense logic, he was using as a language. Whereas now, when you do a completeness proof for uh, a tense language, you actually take the tense language, take it as an object language, study it. The language you are using is the meta language. The set theoretical meta language is the language you are using to study the object language of tense language. I think, and I ha just have to say I think, mm -hmm. I think that to Pryor this would be the wrong way round, that, that you were taking a language that he thought was less good and less accurate mm -hmm. and res less reflective of the structure of the world mm -hmm. to study the language which was more accurate yes, and yes. did describe the study of the world. Now, in my own case, because I was taught by two logicians in Wellington. One was David Lundy, whose view of logic was, I think, that it was formal and therefore had no interpretation, so mm -hmm. you did it axiomatically. Mm -hmm. And one was George Hughes, who has... Um, he and Pryor were very, very close together. And mm -hmm. I remember uh, one story was that shortly after Pryor arrived, George uh, had to go down to we, we have in New Zealand we have a system of what's called external assessing so that one at, at the at the fourth year level all mm. the exams would be sent from one university to another university the mm. idea was that mm. that anybody who came out with a BA or an MA from any New Zealand university in philosophy should be regarded as comparable to anyone else mm. so that Arthur yeah. so that George Hughes went down uh, to stay with Arthur and Mary Pryor 
And I remember George telling me that when they got down, they started talking philosophy, and eventually Mary had to come in and say to them, I think I hear the birds twittering. <laughs> and so yeah. clearly there was a very strong and close professional and personal connection. So I believe that the kind of logic I was taught in Wellington probably reflected Pryor's views about logic more than the more standard views. We did we did the Hink and Completeness theorem in fourth year logic, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I never really understood what the game was because I was never really I was never really taught explicitly what a semantics for predicate mm -hmm. logic was. Mm -hmm. And so I, I and I think that there were two reasons. Mm -hmm. One was David Lundy's view about logic as being formal. And mm -hmm. one was probably mm -hmm. George's view under Pryor's influence of, of thinking of logic mm -hmm. as as a formal language that you could use to describe mm -hmm. the structure of things. So when I went to mm -hmm. Manchester, even though we had done a completeness proof, I didn't really know what the point of a completeness proof was. No. So mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. my view was mm -hmm. naively like that. It was it was only when I came back to Wellington and started teaching modal logic that I really had to learn what semantic, what a set theoretical semantics was, um, perhaps even why people thought that it was uh, was important and what mm. a completeness mm. proof was. Mm. So that um, in that sense, I think my own view was being brought up, not appreciating that there were the ways, mm. that there was this distinction. Mm. Mm, yes, and and yes. mm. only coming to the, the mm. if you like, the more standard view of semantics later on, yes. after I had got back. Yes, and of course we now have some modern developments with hybrid uh, logic, which um, makes a new mix of the cards, sure. as it were, yes. uh, yeah. which is uh, really very interesting. Yes. And which was, in fact, in, in, in some ways anticipated by prior uh, himself, yes. although not worked out in, in yes. the same degree of detail. That's right, because uh, a lot of uh, a lot of what you see as semantics, Pryor tends to think of as translation into the object language. Mm. In, 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 mm. he, I, he, he was aware of the fact that you could take a structure and use it to interpret an object language with mm. operators in it, but when he actually investigated these problems, he so often just added the accessibility relation to the object language and added quantification over the, the points to the object mm -hmm. language and then talked mm -hmm. about the, the semantic interpretation as rather the equivalence between mm -hmm. one object mm -hmm. language sentence and another one. So yes, that's yes. right. So you, you, do, mm -hmm. you do bring the, the mm -hmm. metalinguistic way of doing semantics mm -hmm. into the object language itself. And mm -hmm. I think that that is in tune with, cause I suspect that his view was if you really want to think of a relation between instances more mm -hmm. basic than, a ten than tense operators, mm -hmm. then what you are really doing is saying the object language is not very good as it is, so we'll have to extend the object language. I think he, I think he, he always thought of it that way. Yes, yes. Thank you, very interesting. Um, you mentioned this, uh, this uh, nice uh, little story about Pryor and Hughes going on discussing yeah. till till early morning, and Mary Pryor coming coming in and saying, "I can now hear the birds singing," yeah. and that actually reminds me uh, of stories that that Mary uh, has has told us on various uh, occasions about this um, this joy uh, that was going together with the work, the enthusiasm about logic and yeah. philosophy. Um, so turn we now, at least for a short mm -hmm. spell, to, um, to, to these human aspects. Uh, how was Pryor as a supervisor? Do you have any recollections of specific uh, episodes, uh, including perhaps your PhD defense? <laughs> well, it's true. Yes, yes, I, I, I've forgotten about the PhD. When I first met him, I mean, there was the, 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 he was always, I think, out to tease or shock you. I know, <laughs> my, when, when I first met him, his first words to me were, well, Mr. Cresswell, isn't it a pity that God doesn't exist? <laughs> I, I don't know quite why it was supposed to be a pity, but, uh, but he mm -hmm. just saw me as a naive student. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the supervision, it's hard to remember things. What I do remember is I used to see him once a fortnight, and I would come with a list of questions. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that he ever answered any of my questions, but I would say something, and that would remind him of something, and he would go off and very enthusiastic about something which quite often wasn't wasn't the question that was bothering me. Uh, but um, yeah, the, the, but 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 
nevertheless, I was in a sense left on my own and, and, and developed things. The PhD defence, now that was interesting. The, the external examiner at that point was C.A. Meredith. And they asked me a number of questions. Only the three of us were, were in there. Uh, they asked me a number of questions, but I think they wanted the um, they wanted the oral exam to be as short as possible because I had a car, and Arthur had got some money from the university for us all to have lunch, and he wanted to see some churches in Cheshire, so we had a very short um, <laughs> examination, uh, which was. They said very little except they wanted some rewriting. I mean, I had to, it was about a year later before the thing was actually done because they, they wanted certain, certain clarifications. By that time, uh, Meredith had either had died or was ill, and uh, Bill Neal had to come in to, um, to be the, the right, substitute right. examiner, but that was just for sort of formal reasons. But um, we had, we, we dro I, I do remember driving around Cheshire on a beautifully sunny day and having mm -hmm. a nice lunch somewhere in, somewhere in Cheshire, looking at churches. Mm -hmm. And I have several, I have a photograph of Meredith lying on a gravestone. That, that's actually a very funny piece <laughs> of information because we know this, uh, this picture yeah. uh, and have discussed it with Mary, but, but she did not mention at the time, maybe she did not remember that it was oh, yes. from this tour yes. where, where you yes, were I present. Know. I can um, even I can even tell you the dates. About, I don't yeah. remember it now, but it was yeah. it was sometime in yeah. 1963. Yeah. And I have another picture of Mary yeah. going to look at a church yeah. or disappearing. Yeah. I didn't, yeah. for some reason yeah. or other, on that um, trip, I didn't actually I don't actually have any pictures yeah. of, of Arthur from that afternoon. No, but no. I've got Mary, no. one of Mary, oh. Meredith's lying on the yeah. gravestone. <laughs> I, I remember Mary described him as impish. Yes. <laughs> and uh, I yes, mean, if, if Arthur was out to it. tease, yes. maybe yes. he was even worse. <laughs> yes. Yes, but Meredith looked impish. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. No, that that, that oh. was true. Yeah. <laughs> um, Samuel Kripke uh, paid a visit to uh, Manchester yes. during your own time there, yes, I believe. That's right. Uh, do you have any uh, recollections from this well, visit? Well. Um, couple of recollections. One was that everybody else seemed to understand exactly what Kripke was saying, and I, I tend to be a bit lost. I think it was because I still hadn't yet quite got the concept of semantics, mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. I always put the success of our modal logic book due to the fact that I was a little bit stupid and didn't really quite understand it, and therefore when it came to write it up, I had to write it up and George Hughes was the same. We were both, in a way, a little bit stupid, and we had to work so hard at this that 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 um, that we we really had to try to say, right, if we find it so hard to understand, yeah. we've got to write it up mm. in a way for other people. But the other yeah. thing that I remember about Kripke's visit was that he, uh, Mary asked him, "Would you like a cup of tea?" And he said, "Oh yes, I'd like a cup of tea." She brought a cup of tea and sat it beside him, and he went on, and I think. The, uh, an hour later or so, the, uh, we, uh, you know, I remember me watching the cup of tea getting colder and colder <laughs> and colder as, as Kripke was talking completely oblivious uh, yes. to it. Yes. But he was he was presenting the the material that this was this would be in early 1963, I think that Kripke yes. came through. I don't remember the exact date, but I do no. remember no. I do remember the visit. Montague yeah. came through also yeah. and mm -hmm. gave the Hangman yeah. paradox. Kripke came through mm -hmm. and talked about the. Um, uh, the model theory of modal logic at that point. Yes, mm. uh, those, those those were great days uh, with uh, people like that well, <laughs> gathering were, in they, such a small. They were great place. in another yeah, way yeah, because yeah. the subject was manageable. I mean, when I look at the developments now, mm. I mean, I, I just yeah. so much is happening even in modal logic mm. that I barely understand. In those mm. days, mm. Mm. you could you could have a, you could know what the subject was yes. and the. The, yeah, yeah. the things now that are so commonplace that we even teach to second year students were so exciting. So to, to, to discover how you could prove that one system was not the same as another by looking at its, its, mm. its model theoretic stuff. There was, mm. there was an excitement about those days that I think when I look back at the things I've written, it was hard even in the second version, the new introduction, I didn't think we could quite recapture the sense of excitement that was there in 1968 mm. in, the, in, mm. in, the, in, the, in the first part. Oh. Oh. Anyway, 
uh, for some time, uh, Pryor was obviously inspired by and attracted to uh, Lukacevic's idea of three-valued logic, uh, not least as an approach mm. to the logic of contingency and especially, of course, future contingence. This is uh, apparent also in formal logic. However, Pryor obviously abandoned this approach without ever making this move very explicit. Could you give us any uh, information on this change in, in uh, Pryor's attitude or approach? I'm not sure that I can help much there. I mean, I, oh. th this is something I've looked at Of since. course, it was in the 50s, uh, yes, quite some he, time before. That's right. Uh. He, I, I never, I have to admit that I never quite accepted the I don't think I ever rejected bivalence the way he was tempted mm. to do. Mm. I, I mm. think I almost mm. regarded it as a reductio ad absurdum of uh, certain theories of future contingence that mm. you had to give up mm. bivalence. Yeah. It seemed to me almost a trivial modal logic mistake that if you think of the modal operator, a necessity operator of, in, of inevitableness or now being determined or something like that, mm -hmm. it seems clear that while it, I mean Aristotle's sea battle, while it may be definite that there will or won't be a sea battle, it's not definite that there will and it's not definite that there won't and if you take definite to be a modal operator, um, it's very hard to see why one, why one shouldn't say, well, there is a truth of the matter. Mm -hmm. It's just that it's not now determined what that truth of mm -hmm. the matter is. So I, I'm probably not a good person to talk to about Pryor's attitude to future contingents because it's something that mm. I don't think ever grabbed me. No, and no. Um, I was probably not as aware as I might have been of how important mm. this was to him. Because, yes. because I was there to write a PhD, I wasn't so much there to, if you like, <laughs> to be writing, I, was, I, I wasn't somebody who was going to be writing a biography of prior. No, no, of course. So, so there's, there's <laughs> a certain yeah. sense in which, yeah. and it's, it's a little bit sad for me now because I feel so much was going on then mm -hmm. that so many of the questions that you and others and I are all asking are, are yeah. ones that I could have found the answer to if I'd asked him then, if I'd yes, realized yes. <laughs> that, that, that 40 years later, 50 years later, yeah. yes. it might be important to know the answer to Yes, that. but... Uh, and, and when you go as a student, you don't yeah. always appreciate it. No, but, but, but it's <laughs> obvious because you're preoccupied not with yourselves, yeah. but with the subject, <laughs> yeah, that's right. which is also why uh, so much contribution has been achieved, yeah. I, 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 I think. But now we come to pry a little bit into, yeah, <laughs> into the past, as much as and, possible. And I wish I, I, wish uh, I, I knew uh, more. Uh, but, but, of course, this is also a very specific question about three-value yes, uh, yeah. uh, uh, yeah. uh, uh, logic. And, and um, anyway, I mean, it has not carried, three-value logic has not carried a lot of success a anyway, so... I think uh, it, yes, I, I always, in a way, one of the big things to realize <laughs> was that you, if you started, I mean, Initially, with modal logic, you might think, mm. okay, so there are four values, aren't there? There's necessarily true, there's contingently true, there's contingently false, there's necessarily false. And then you suddenly realize that contingently true plus contingently false might give you a contingent proposition or might give you a necessary proposition. Mm. So you, it, it was rapidly clear. Mm. One of the interesting things was, and and this is interesting because way, way back, and this is something I only realized a little while ago, one of, one of Arthur's very early articles in modal logic does recognize that a four-valued logic can represent truth today and tomorrow, today but not tomorrow, tomorrow but not today, and neither today nor tomorrow. One of his very early modal logic articles where he's getting much closer to a Kripke-style semantics than he seemed, it was, it's almost as though he drew back from it. Yes. Because yes. in that, uh, I forget well. which paper it is, it's a, it's, I think it's, it's, it's a paper, I think a paper in analysis in, in 54, or whatever it was, but, but mm. there is one in which he explicitly, yeah. mm. more or less explicitly introduces a model with four worlds in it and, and mm. says so and points out that you can generalize this by having more and that's why we can't we can't have a definite mm. 
m valued mm. logic for a mm. finite m because if you think of it in terms mm. of the number of worlds mm. we don't want to put a limit on mm. on how many worlds there might be mm. and what what's interesting to me and this is just something in retrospect was that if he had wanted to do semantics in that way he was he was on the verge of, of doing that and perhaps mm. something about mm. his attitude mm. to to modality mm. Mm. Uh, stopped him from doing that. However, that that's that's retrospective. That doesn't. That's no. not anything that was familiar to me when I was in Manchester. But 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 it is, I think, sensible and fair to say that in the early fifties he was still working out his uh, yes, uh, I think uh, right. uh, position. Uh, and I, I remember Mary Pryor mentioning uh, that he went to a conference in Australia. I think in nineteen fifty one, right. and that was when he got acquainted with modal logic or more acquainted with modal logic and went back and took inspiration for modern style symbolic logic okay and that was the the the, the time uh when when he started yeah. down that path yeah. yeah so and that of course took some years to yes yes reach a fir firmer uh form um prior's view on logic we have already uh I think inevitably touched on it several <laughs> yeah. times, uh, but it was obviously opposed to both ends of the spectrum in his own day, uh, in England at least, <coughs> that is if one may put it like that, both to Quine as the ultimate hardliner yeah. and to ordinary language philosophy as the softer uh, pragmatists. How would you uh, characterize uh, Pryor's conception of logic as compared with his contemporaries and in particular the relation between logic and natural language? Well, there are a number of things here, and, and again this is a little bit more hindsight. I'm more and more inclined to think that Pryor was in spirit an ordinary language philosopher, but he did his ordinary for language philosophy using a formal language. Now that sounds a bit contradictory, but in a sense he was, when you actually look at um, when you look at the way he did it, he seemed to to want to to want to to address these problems uh, in 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 that particular way, and and that I think is is something that is that is important. The, the questions that were important to him were, I think, very like the questions that were important to ordinary language philosophers. And there was another aspect of that question which reminded me of something else, and I can't remember, can you... The, the well, I, I mentioned Quine, uh, yes, his opposition to yes. Quine at one That's end right. of the spectrum. True. And, uh, and, and, and then the ordinary language philosophy at, at the other end. Yes, right. he, was, he, was, he was doing both of those things, but I don't think, I mean, Quine... I think he was addressing the problems the ordinary language philosophers were addressing. I think that Quine and Carnap were really saying that for the purpose of science we don't need ordinary language. We want to use a language which is connected with the purpose of science. I think Pryor wanted to say, well look, um, we are actually I'm interested in the same things that ordinary language philosophers are interested in, but I'm not going to say that the the way a particular ordinary language uh, phenomenon uh, appears in, in, in ordinary surface English need necessarily give you a clue to exactly the logical structure of things. I can I can explain it using using the formal language. I think that's probably uh, that that's probably what was going on there. I know that um, in one of, uh, it was one of your interviews with Mary Pryor, she talked about how he would come home from dinner at an Oxford College flushed with <laughs> yes, excitement, yes. it was the phrase. Yeah, I, I, yeah, and that yeah. was really tangling, mm -hmm. uh, uh, tangling with the ordinary language philosophers. Mm -hmm. I don't sense him coming home flushed with excitement after talking to Quine. No. I don't I don't um, sense that. Perhaps no one would. Yeah, well, actually, sense. maybe one shouldn't quote this in an interview <laughs> that will be televised <laughs> or publicized. Uh, but I remember uh, actually uh, him saying uh, uh, in one place, maybe in a letter, I don't remember where, that fool Quine. 
<laughs> and uh, that was not exactly his line. Ordinarily, he yeah. would do yeah. his best for his opponents. Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Uh, but yes. in this case, he really thought that this that yes. he, he was a narrow-minded uh, uh, yes. person. Yes. I, I um, would have liked to have seen much more of his views on Wittgenstein and on Carnap. Yeah. I mean, he yeah. mentions yeah. them. Yeah. He mentions mm. quite a lot. Mm -hmm. And he brackets mm -hmm. Quine with Smart, and of course he was great friends with Jack Smart. Yes, so yes, that there was uh, a there was a there was a personal, even mm -hmm. even though Smart mm -hmm. was in a way the kind of Australian disciple of Quine. When 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 Smart mm -hmm. went from Oxford yeah. to Australia, he was yes. more or less the 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 the, uh, the, um, the Australian mm -hmm. Quine in yes. a certain mm -hmm. sense. But and and he mm -hmm. and Smart and and, um, and 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 Arthur were were were, were very close there, mm -hmm. but. Um, the um, but the other but the the I I one of the things that I'm interested in is now is if you look at Carnap and Wittgenstein's Tractatus, one of the things that they were very strong about was the truth conditional theory of meaning, and I've been looking mm -hmm. through I've been trying to look through Arthur's works to see what his views about that were. I, I think that like many ordinary language philosophers, he probably thought, well, look, you don't have to have a theory of meaning. We, we, we mean certain things and we know what we mean. I, there's very little discussion. There are very few references to the Tractatus, mm -hmm. very few references to Wittgenstein. Mm -hmm. he, you, he talks about Carnap, but not so much about his... He'll mention Carnap in the group of a number of people, or as an example, you know, Professor Carnap is flying to the moon is yeah, one of yeah. the <laughs> example sentences yes. in Time and Modality. Mm -hmm. um, but there is very little taking seriously of either Wittgenstein's Tractatus mm -hmm. or um, Carnap's use of it. Carnap yeah, certainly yeah. took from Wittgenstein the truth conditional theory of meaning. Yeah. That was absolutely vital mm -hmm. to Carnap in Meaning Necessity and in other yeah, places. Yeah. Um, he got it from Wittgenstein. Uh, and there is not practically no hint whatsoever mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. this. There's there's some interesting stuff in in the prior critical mm -hmm. notice mm -hmm. of Tarski mm -hmm. where it looks as though he's mm -hmm. saying that while formal language has a recursive specification of truth conditions, mm -hmm. natural mm -hmm. language doesn't. It's not it's not absolutely clear, um, but it almost looks like saying mm -hmm. that so the uh, the thing I miss a little bit is any mm -hmm. explicit discussion of this mm -hmm. alternative theory mm -hmm. that's um, it may well be that uh, this is why I tend to link him with ordinary language mm -hmm. philosophers because mm -hmm. there's very little discussion that I can find in ordinary language philosophy in Strauss and mm -hmm. Austin people like that very little discussion of Wittgenstein's truth conditional theory of meaning now Wittgenstein mm -hmm. himself of mm -hmm. course uh, had given up his earlier theory but but I, I that is something mm -hmm. which I, I th that's a connection that I don't find I wasn't mm -hmm. uh, again it's not anything that I have any help from from my time in Manchester but just looking yeah, at yeah, the, yeah. the prior writings now yeah. is something that I don't uh, but I said certainly in a yeah. sense the way he talked about for, even when I was at Manchester I didn't feel that when I was talking with Pryor, I was talking with people who had engaged in a different discipline mm -hmm. from when I was talking from mm -hmm. with other mm -hmm. philosophers at mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, even though, uh, according to Mary Pryor, he was very impressed with Richard Montague as a brilliant mind uh, and a brilliant logician, he apparently uh, never took much interest in Montague and his school in, in their approach providing a systematical translation uh, uh, relation between natural language and, and, and uh, formal right. logical and, and, and uh, language. That, uh, that's right. And that of course is a tricky one because it's, it's, it's quite anachronistic. I mean you, you uh, I don't know either of Pryor's views about Chomsky. I mean the, the, what you've got mm -hmm. is I regard Chomsky and Montague as two people where Chomsk, where in the, when I was brought up, there was ordinary mm -hmm. language philosophy and there were logicians, and everybody was supposed to agree that the languages of formal logic were quite different from natural languages. Mm -hmm. Then along comes Chomsky as a linguist who said syntax has an underlying formal structure. Mm -hmm. 
and Montague who said, and furthermore, just as, and Montague is quite explicit, this, just as Chomsky says syntax has an underlying formal structure, we can attach this to an underlying logical structure and produce an account of the semantics of natural language yeah. in yeah. those terms. Now, these developments, I mean, I, I went I went to UCLA in 1970, mainly at Pryor's mm -hmm. recommendation. In fact, mm -hmm. I, he said at one point after he'd been there in the 1960s, he mm -hmm. said that was probably the place in the world where most of the good you know, intentional logic is being done. And I took that and I wrote to him and mm -hmm. I said, look, I would like, I have to go on leave. Would you like to uh, uh, support me there? And he, he wrote a letter to UCLA and they gave, got me a little bit of teaching while I was there. And when I got there, I, uh, David Lewis told me that Montague was, was uh, giving some lectures on English as a formal language. I didn't even know what that meant. And I went along to Montague's lecture and Montague explained mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. he thought that Chomsky was right as opposed to the ordinary language philosophers. Mm -hmm. In other words, the mm -hmm. linguists actually mm -hmm. had a better structure than the ordinary language philosophers yes. did about mm -hmm. ordinary language. Mm -hmm. And that he was doing the same. Uh, for now that was 1970. So that was, mm -hmm. that although, although uh, Pryor certainly knew Montague, in fact Montague visited um, uh, Manchester when I was there. Although Pryor knew Montague, I'm not at all sure that he was aware of Montague's views on English as a formal language. Mm. Those, uh, uh, and either he was, it's not, it's not that I think he was aware of them and rejected them. I don't get any sense in anything he said. Mm. He makes disparaging remarks about um, the use of model theory, where he talks about uh, possible world semantics as being relations between teacups more, well, the accessibility relation is a more expensive relation than between teacups and the teacups and the more expensive than provides a model. So he, he certainly, he certainly expressed mm. skepticism about the value of this. Mm. I, but I don't know what on earth he would have said, and I can't find anything in, in his writings mm. that suggests that he was aware of what Montague was doing. I mean, mm. uh, because, I mean, I, when I went to UCLA in 1970, that was quite, to me, that was completely mind-blowing, and I think it mm. was mm. For a, to a lot of logicians mm. and a lot of linguists, and Montague in my opinion, started a revolution in semantics, uh, a revolution which sadly seems to have passed the philosophical world by, though it's, 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 it's been quite evident in many parts of the linguistic world, but for quite a while this was a, this was a completely new approach to studying natural language. And I would have thought it would be a little bit more difficult for someone like Arthur Pryor to disparage a lot of the detailed results being done within mm. by linguists within the model theory for for natural languages mm. and that's why i mm. think that he probably his death probably came before he appreciated yeah. what was going to happen so i don't think i don't think you're going to get very much from that and 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 uh, when I'd last when I last saw him when he came to New Zealand in 1965 and that was before I was it wasn't until 1970 mm. that I was aware mm. of Montague's work as applied to the semantics of natural language and so it wouldn't surprise me if um, if, if 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 Arthur just had not come to terms with it or not appreciated. I know when um, Montague came to Manchester, he gave a talk on the Hangman Paradox, which wasn't yep. anything to do with English as a formal language. So I really don't know. I can, I can conjecture what his, view, what his views might have been, but then, of course, people's views change. I mean, if you, saw mm -hmm. the, if, mm -hmm. if you really saw linguists actually doing formal semantics, linking it with a model theory, applying it to... Mm -hmm relative constructions in Swahili or whatever, you know, I mean, something like that. I mean, who knows what the response, what, what his response would have been to oh. that. So that's mm. why I suspect that this whole, I, this whole way of looking at semantics, especially mm. within linguistics and within the philosophy of language, uh, 
was something that came just a little bit too late for him to yeah, take. Yeah, he did not, uh, as it were, li yeah. live long enough to that, pick it up and address it. Yeah, uh, that, that uh, is my that guess from, from yeah, what yeah. I remember from uh, my own experience uh, uh, and from uh, what uh, I've, I've read uh, about what he uh, wrote. Uh, uh. Um, Pryor's uh, relation to metaphysics was also uh, atypical uh, for, 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 his own, for his own day. Um, uh, how, how, how do, do you have anything to say about his view on, on uh, metaphysics on, or the legitimacy of uh, metaphysical issues in uh, logic in the early 60s? Well, I mean, when I was there, uh, we, I mean, I, mm -hmm. I regarded Pryor as a person who accepted propositions that could be distinct but not logically equivalent, and it wasn't. And this is surprising, because at the time I was at, at Manchester, he was writing Objects of Thought. Mm -hmm. And Objects of Thought is basically a very anti-metaphysical view of, I mean, it's basically saying mm -hmm. you mustn't, mm -hmm. you don't need a domain of propositions, you shouldn't have a domain of propositions, you mustn't, um, you mustn't um, understand things in that way. He was writing that uh, at that time. I've been looking at that just very recently because it seems to me that the anti-metaphysical picture that you get in Objects of Thought is something which goes very nicely with the attitude to metaphysics you had in by the ordinary language philosophers. I mean, it's almost as though you, uh, you say, well, look, um, uh, it's, uh, it's a fact that, that it's raining. So that suggests there are facts. No, no, it's a fact that it's raining. It's just a fancy way of saying it's raining. That mm -hmm. sounds very much like mm -hmm. an ordinary language philosopher. So we can, if we find simple ways of saying things which don't appear to make reference to these entities we don't like, then that's enough to say we don't mm -hmm. have to use these entities. And when you read objects of thought, you, it seems to me you get a logician doing the same sort of thing that Strawson and Austin and other people would be doing mm -hmm. as far as metaphysics were concerned. Mm -hmm. So I don't mm -hmm. know that he felt this in earlier days. He had, mm -hmm. there's an article, is it an article called in there's one article it's it's not non there's the, there's two articles entities and then there's non entities and there is an earlier article in which he seems to be arguing for the existence of all these things that in objects of thought he seems to have repudiated mm -hmm. so but the way he repudiates them reminds me very much of it's it's almost as though particularly mm -hmm. in the there are quite large portions of objects of thought which don't use any logic and during those portions uh, it's very hard to just to realize, you know, are you reading, are you reading Pryor or Strawson or whatever? So I think that his attitude to metaphysics at that time, and this is of course by the time he was, he, this was when he'd gone to Britain, was at Manchester, about to go to Oxford. And I suspect that at that point his attitude to metaphysics was very much anti-metaphysical, and very much ordinary language, because he says, look, um, names, I mean, his attitude to ontological commitment, which he, which he objects, uh, I mean, he, 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 he d thinks that, that that was one of Quine's, uh, that Quine's doctrine of ontological commitment was one of the silliest doctrines he'd ever come across. And I think that was because when you look at it, he says, okay, um, names refer to things. But but uh, sentences don't. So so e where you get apparent quantification over sentences, it doesn't commit you to anything. You only get ontological commitment when you commit it to names. Now that seems to be very specific to the surface structure of English, because it's not clear that you couldn't have another language in which what are names in English are sentences in that other language, or vice versa. It's not. That's not clear to me. So that's very much the way. I see an ordinary language philosopher as doing mm -hmm. metaphysics. Mm -hmm. So, leaving aside Pryor's uh, delight in using logic in this, the way he talks about metaphysics mm -hmm. seems to be very much like ordinary language philosophy, mm -hmm. which, mm -hmm. in a way, was very positivistic in, in a lot of ways and said, look, you know, there isn't, we don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We mm. don't. You, mm. a, a lot of metaphysics is just nonsense. Well, thank you for these. Uh, I, I think very interesting uh, observations. Um,
Well, as a conclusion to this uh, in, in, interview, I would like to ask you to, as it were, freestyle on two themes. Um, your view on Pryor's role in the development of modern logic and logical philosophy, including his relations to other uh, philosophers such as Hughes or Findlay mm -hmm. and, and others, and your impressions of Pryor the man. Okay. <laughs> Well, oh, now it's a, a, a lot of things. Yeah, it is uh, a lot of things okay. I, can, um, I can repeat. <laughs> no, 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 no. The first thing, in terms of Pryor's legacy, I think that you can often measure the greatness of somebody by saying their legacy is in an almost a sense, I won't say greater than they were. I mean, my other example is Russell's On Denoting. I think mm. that Russell's essay in On Denoting has more in it than even Russell saw. Mm -hmm. Pryor started, among other things, tense logic. He was one of the pivotal figures in the whole development of the formal semantics. And what we've been talking about is that it was something about which he himself had reservations. Mm -hmm. So here you have somebody whose legacy is, in a sense, greater. It transcended his own reservations. Mm -hmm. It led to things mm -hmm. that he perhaps may not have been sympathetic to or may not have thought he should mm -hmm. be sympathetic to. Now, I have to say mm -hmm. that because yes, yes, yes. you set going something and it may be something that you had, he had reservations in the 1960s, his views changed. Mm -hmm. Who knows what would have happened if he'd lived another 20, 30 years mm -hmm. and suddenly uh, seen yeah. all the developments that, mm -hmm. that have happened. Mm -hmm. So what you've got there is somebody whose greatness mm -hmm. actually mm -hmm. transcends it. Mm -hmm. As far as prior as a man, well, there are one or two stories. There was the story that when he first, um, when he first um, met me. The other story was this. One of the, um, we had a, an MA student at Manchester. I, I think it was from Iraq. It was, it was certainly from a country in the Middle East, and I think it was from Iraq. And Arthur said to him, and what is your Muslim name? And this guy scratched his head. He said, well, I'm not actually a believer. And Pryor had to explain to them that in Christian countries, people have Christian names as well as surnames. So in Muslim countries, they would have to have Muslim names as, as well as surnames. And it, it took this, 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 this student really took a little while to understand what was going on. But that's, that's one of the, the sorts of uh, the, the playful attitudes that, that, that I remember. Um, I remember once uh, his singing at a party. There, there, there was a song, My Name, It Is Sam Hall, It Is Sam Hall, and he sang that mm -hmm. because the other professor of philosophy at Otago was a woman named Dorothy Emmett, who was the Sir Samuel Hall Professor of Philosophy, and she had to give the Sir Samuel Hall oration every year, and mm -hmm. we had a party yeah. after that. And I remember our <laughs> prior singing that song at the party. There, there was that, there was that kind of, uh, and this has been noted by many other people, and yes, there was mm -hmm. Um, my stories are just uh, some among many, but there was certainly that playfulness and that teasingness, mm -hmm. and that was um, he could. It, I mean, he, he could he, when when he met me, uh, and I was a naive person. I mean, yes, it was it was teasing me. Um, sometimes I don't know that the teasing the teasing we know was in 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 good part. Um, it could be. I, I don't know what he would have been like as an undergraduate teacher. I don't know what he would be like to students uh, marking or grading students. I don't know any of that. Um, certainly he was, he was always very positive and, and helpful to me. Though, as I said, it was a helpfulness that was in terms of the enthusiasm for the subject. It wasn't it wasn't um, the person yeah. who said, look, you've got to write a PhD thesis, you've got to, you should do this and this and this and this, it should be this many pages long, you should do this in that mm -hmm. chapter, you should do this mm -hmm. in that chapter, I've taken what you've read here and I think you should change that and change that and do this and do this and do this and do this. It was basically, oh, that's an interesting idea. Well, I wonder what you do, and then, then you'd go off and then there was that kind of, of, of and that was a kind of enthusiasm uh, for it. Um, it's... The people he influenced, I think, were, as far as I can tell, they were they were the people, the people that he knew he, in in New Zealand. I think he and George Hughes were perhaps unique at that time. 
there were a succession of people at Otago that he probably uh, had some contact with. I don't know how close it was. I mean, he knew people like Passmo, who was at Otago for a while. Uh, Raphael was at Otago for a while. Mackey, I think, was at Otago for a while. Um, they, a lot of those were people who had or were in sympathy with what was going on in, in Oxford, the ordinary language philosophers. I don't know how close his relations were there. I know he and George Hughes were quite close. Auckland at that stage tended to have people who were not so much from what we now call analytical mm -hmm. philosophy. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how close the mm -hmm. how close the connections were. So those were those were the connections in New Zealand. I can't speak for the connections he made in Oxford, but I do know that it was uh, uh, Peter Geach and Elizabeth Anscombe were people who were quite close to. Bill Neal, I think yes. he was quite close to. Um, they were, in general, they were people that I like to think of as who were in, in a lot of spirit were ordinary language philosophers. They were not the Quines and Carnaps. They, 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 they were more like the ordinary language philosophers, but they were the ordinary language philosophers who were sympathetic to logic. Yes. And there were a few yeah. of them. Yes. And Geach and Neil would be clear examples yeah. yes. there. Yeah. Uh, Anscombe, yes. Um, uh, I, I didn't know uh, Martha Neil so well, so I don't mm -hmm. know how, how close he was to both mm -hmm. of them. But uh, I, think, I think both... Um, I think uh, I think Elizabeth Anscombe makes a little bit fun of him once when she's talking in her essay about Aristotle. She describes some view of Aristotle's and thinks of it as being something silly, and she and she says, "Well, look, sometimes people produce views that we may think are a little bit silly. As for example, in our own day, I have heard heard it described as a problem of how a man could be famous when he is dead." And I have a hunch <laughs> that she has prior in mind. Yes, she doesn't yes, say, yes. but I have a hunch she has prior in <laughs> yes, mind there. Yes, yes. And, and I do know that, um, that prior was, I think, fairly close to both mm -hmm. Geach and Anscombe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So those were mm -hmm. the kind of people mm -hmm. that he tended, to, he, tended, he tended to mix with. But of course, again, you have to remember, I was a PhD student in Manchester. It wasn't, mm -hmm. I was not, if you like, playing at his level no, at that no, point. No. I wasn't a colleague oh. of his. I was, I was the PhD student oh. at that point. So, clearly, clearly. so um, some of, um, I, I'm conjecturing, right. some of it is what mm. I've picked up later. Mm. Some mm. of it is was I, what I can remember. Mm. I mean, I can remember the way George Hughes used mm. to talk about him, mm. and I can remember, mm. uh, and I can remember a prior visiting. Mm. Mm. Yes, yes. Uh, in fact, I haven't prepared a question on this, but the, 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 the remarks you made about his legacy s transcending uh, uh, even his, his own thought in his own day, you also have the example of, of computer science, yes. uh, where his systems uh, have proved uh, very yeah. uh, uh, useful. Uh, it so happens that I was myself at the Microsoft Research Summit in Seattle uh, a, month, a month ago, where Leslie Lamport, uh, the Turing Award winner, uh, mm -hmm. gave, gave a talk on his temporal logic of actions. Uh, I haven't studied that before, and when I sat there uh, and, and, and saw what he was doing, I, I, I couldn't help thinking of necessity operators, future yes. operators. Yes. It, it was just couched in another language. Uh, and in fact, I asked him about uh, this, but he didn't. Uh, he he didn't seem happy well, uh, to be reminded that, of the of the temporal logic provenance. That's, that's uh, in a more. Uh, that, that's uh, a greater tribute, in a uh, way, uh, when uh, an idea uh, has become so part of us mm -hmm. that we even forget who started it. That's mm -hmm. the. I, I, I remember mm -hmm. somebody telling me when you read Descartes, you think it's all trivial, mm -hmm. and he pointed out, no, it's because of Descartes that it's now so obvious to us that we regard it as trivial. So mm. if in mm. fact so many of Pryor's ideas are such mm. that the people mm. articulating mm. them don't even associate mm. them with him, that in a sense is even more a remark about the legacy transcending the person. And in a way that's mm. perhaps the biggest tribute you could pay to somebody. Thank you. I think that makes for a lovely concluding <laughs> remark. Thank you for this interview, well, Professor Crestwood.